Hi there. Welcome to Light From Above. My name is David Kenny. Glad you could be with us on the program. We're talking about some series of lessons about the New Testament church. We've talked about the idea of the New Testament church as a called out group of people, ecclesia. We've talked about the idea of the New Testament church is a body, soma. And today we're going to look at the idea of the New Testament church in portrait, basilia. And so that's important when we talk about that term. And if you're familiar with the term Bastille, then you'll obviously know where we're going. And where we're going is, we'll just give you sort of a preview to take a look at as we go through our lesson. We're going to define that term and then answer some questions. Who is the king? Where is the kingdom? And what does a king do? And who obeys the king? And I'm sure you can answer those questions really quickly. The question <laughs> isn't just a matter of being able to answer the question. What we're trying to challenge people to do, are you actually following the things that the New Testament has, would have you to do? Is the church following what is spelled out in the New Testament? And, and it's not just a matter of opinion. And that's really what a lot of this lesson has to do with. But let's look at the term basilia. What does it mean? Well, the word appears 162 times in 154 verses of the King James. The King James translates the word kingdom nearly every time. Although, you know, it may be, you know, different references to different types of kingdoms, that's what the term means. Kingdom. The New Testament church is the kingdom. And there's, that's another one of those pictures. And that's a really important thing to note. You know, some people get caught up, you know, the idea of, well, you know, Jesus came to establish the kingdom, but he didn't do it. And so he established the church instead. But what they fail to realize is the New Testament has several different metaphors in relation to what Christ came to establish that we, you know, that we need to take a look at. And to focus on one of them, in this case, kingdom, and ignore the others, such as church, can lead to error. It can lead to a lot of mistakes and a lot of confusion. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people have fallen into. Well, the ideas of king and kingdom and reigning, they're not new concepts. But take a look at this definition from this theological lexicon uh, dictionary that I have. It says, in every language, a king is a head of state, a sovereign, a monarch, by extension, a head of rep or representative of a group, one who reigns or presides at an event. A kingdom is the land or state governed by a king, and by extension, a collective or persons of things ruled by a common principle, uh, for example, the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. Reign is the exercise of royal power, domination, either absolute personal power or dominating influence. And when I was looking at this dictionary, I came up with these other similar looking words. And I thought I'd just spell them out you know, so you could see them here on this chart. You know, the idea, you, know, you can see they're all related. The term a kingdom, reign, royal, king, uh, to be king, to rule, to reign, the royal. Even, even the word queen uh, comes uh, from that idea, uh, from that same word. And so that's, that's the nature of the way that the, the Greek in the New Testament is. Um, and that's important to note. Well, it's interesting, one of, my, one of my dads and one of my personal favorite people, uh, one of my dad's favorite instructors at the Nashville School of Preaching, his name was Basil Overton. And it's interesting, you know, if you're like a lot of people, and you know, like myself too, when I thought about it, you know, Basil. And that's a spice. You know, some people are like, you know, why would you name a man after a spice? Basil, who would do that? Well, they're missing what, that, what that's talking about. Uh, Basil Overton, he wrote about it, and this is what he said when he did some research on it. He liked to do a lot of research in Greek. He said, Basil is the Greek name for king. It is in such passages as in Matthew 2, 1 in the form Baselos and is translated king. A form of its translated kingdom in Matthew 16, 19. Now, you may wonder, well, how did, how did basil, the spice, get its name? I mean, why would you name a spice king? <laughs> why would you choose that name? Well, they say, now I'm not a cooking expert, but I did a little bit of research on it. And they say that in times past, the spice, basil, the spice, was one of the most predominant spices out there. Matter of fact, it was at one time referred to, and some people still sort of refer to it this way, I've been told, it's the king of all spices, basil. So it has the, you know, it's preeminent of all the other spices, and so they named it that, basil. 
But when we talk about basil, we're not talking about the spice. We're talking about king. That's what the word means. Basil, basilia, king and kingdom. We have a king when we, in the kingdom. But who is the king? Well, we know who that is. If you look at Matthew chapter 2, 1 and 2, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Well, so who is the king? Well, it wasn't Herod. He was a king, but that's not the king that we're talking about. We're talking about the king of the Jews. Who is that? Well, let's go on. Let's look in, Matt, in excuse me, John chapter 18 and verse 37. Notice what Jesus plainly tells Pilate. It says, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, there is no doubt that Jesus is the king when we talk about that. Now, here's the next question. Where's the kingdom? Where's the kingdom? Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 16, 17 through 19. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I left that little A there for you in that bright red. And if you look at that, if you look those phrases up, you'll find out that those tenses of verbs are very specific. It isn't telling us that Peter has the primacy and that Peter could go and do whatever he wanted to do as far as it related to the church. It also didn't tell the apostles that they could do whatever they wanted to do. They couldn't just organize the church however they wanted to do it. Why? Because Christ is the king. We take directions from the king. Well, where are those directions at? Well, they're in his word. He has given his law, and we follow that. Well, that's what the apostles did. The apostles um, brought the word into existence to where we can read and know it. So we can know what the king is. But they were not allowed to write whatever they wanted to write. All the information that's in the New Testament came from heaven. That's where the authority is at. That's a big concept that people sometimes struggle with. You know, they look to other places for authority and religion. They may look to Rome or you know, different locations, Mecca or these other places. No, the authority from the New Testament, it comes from heaven. It comes from the king and no one else. And that's important to note. Well, going right along in John chapter 18, 35 through 36, Jesus spoke to Pilate and he said a few words to him. He didn't talk to him a lot. But what he did say was very significant. And you'll notice that when you know, I highlighted the phrase here, and you'd be amazed at how many people seem to miss that. The conversation between Jesus and Pilate was not all that long, but yet people just skip right over what he said. And notice what he says here. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nature and chief, excuse me, your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now, that's very plain. That's very plain. What's he, what did he tell Pilate? He, he said, Well, my kingdom is not of this world, meaning it's not a physical kingdom like Herod. Herod the king. It's not like Pilate, who the, was the prefect, the governor of the area. It's, it's, you know, it's not like the Roman Empire. It's not a physical kingdom. It's not of this world. It's not of this material. But it's definitely here. It's definitely here. So, I mean, people just skip right over that. And, and how do they skip over it? Well, they'll say things like this. Jesus really came to establish an earthly kingdom. He's going to sit on the literal throne of David. And he's going to reign physically from Israel. 
and that you know all the things that happen in the Middle East are all being orchestrated according to Old Testament prophecy. We're going to have the rapture, we're going to have the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, all those kinds of things that you often hear on TV or on radio or in print is part of this doctrine called premillennialism. But it violates what Jesus told Pilate. My kingdom is not of this world. We would do well. His kingdom is not a physical kingdom in the sense that we generally think of it. Well, where is the kingdom? Some deny the kingdom was established by Jesus. They say, well, no, the church isn't the kingdom. But notice what John wrote in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, is John confused? I mean, he's on the island of Patmos, so he has some kind of, you know, he knows where he's at. But notice he said that he's in the kingdom. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> where is he? Is he confused? How can he be in something that doesn't exist? It's interesting to note, you look at that passage there, uh, it has the idea of kingdom and also has the word tribulation. See, a lot of people look to Revelation and in different passages in Daniel, different things, and they'll say, well, there's going to be a period of tribulation yet future. And we're going to have earthquakes and all these natural disasters and all that's all part of the tribulation. This is all signs that the end is coming. But notice that John not only said that he was in the kingdom, he was also in the tribulation. See, there's a lot of people that mistake, they make a lot of mistakes on that. And that's something you need to pay attention to. John was in the kingdom, present tense. Where was he at? He was in the church. Where was he at physically? He was on the island of Patmos. See, the kingdom is not physical, territorial in the, in the ways that people uh, think that it is or going to be today. Well, what does a king do? What does a king do? He reigns. He reigns. I mean, these are easy answers. You ought to be able to see that. I know. I'm sure you can. I mean, kings is, they just don't sit there. They reign. Well, take a look at what Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 through 13. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Now notice, he's, these words are being spoken to the Son. It's, it's being spoken to Jesus. He's going to reign. He isn't just some kind of angel. You know, a lot of people, they think Jesus is an angel. He's not. He's the Son of God. He's superior to the angels. He's deity. He's reigning. God made certain promises to him, and that he is, and he's fulfilling them. He's reigning now. Well, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 24 through 26. When we continue with the question, what does a king do? The reign on earth will be temporary only because the earth is temporary. Notice what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. I'd like to talk to you a lot about that last enemy, death. Death is an enemy. And it will be destroyed. It will be destroyed at the end when Jesus comes. And that will not be the beginning of the kingdom. It'll be the, it'll be, he'll deliver it up to the Father. It won't be established here on earth. You take a look at that passage here in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26. It doesn't have the idea that when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back on the earth and he's going to live in Jerusalem and he's going to set up a kingdom and have all this material battle and all that. No, that's not there. It's not there. Not there at all. You really need to give that some thought. And there are a lot of teachers out there that'll tell you the things of premillennialism. It's so attractive and appealing to people that, you know, they just get caught up in it. They have TV shows and movies about it, and people are so fascinated by it, and 
uh, and they just you know, they go they sell all kinds of books about it and everything and but you need to follow your New Testament and look at what it's telling you look what it's telling you well who obeys the king that's another good question who obeys him if the king's reigning who obeys him well that's important to note Paul wrote to the church at Philippi and he made this statement therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice that everyone should bow. Everyone should bow. Now you might say, well, not everybody does that. But they should. They should. There is going to be a day when Jesus comes back to, and gathers up his people, and he's going to judge the world as king. And punishment for those, as, as tragic as that is, is going to be meted out. There will be a judgment. There will be accounting when he returns. He's going to judge people by his New Testament, by his word. So he's not just reigning in the sense, you know, people can ignore him. And people will say, well, I just ignore Jesus. I, don't, you know, I just do whatever I want to do. And that's true. People could do that now. But there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day of judgment. We're going to be held accountable for the things that we did. And we should be bowing the knee to Jesus the Christ. Sadly, a lot of people don't do that. But they should. Well, let's go on. Let's look in Acts chapter 5. 31 through 33, Peter is confronting the Sanhedrin with their guilt and denying the kingship of the Son of God. Notice how they responded. Him God has exalted to his right hand to the Prince and Savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now that's Peter talking to him. And he's talking to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are the people that actually were responsible directly for turning Jesus over to the Romans that, that ended up in the crucifixion. These are the same people that Peter's talking to. You know, that, that timid, fearful, scared, this is a different Peter. He's, he's been changed. Well, notice it says, when they heard this, back in Acts chapter 5, when they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. They didn't like it. They didn't like it. Who obeys the king? Well, they all should, but not everybody does. But there will be a reckoning for that. There will be a reckoning. Who obeys the king? Those who have opportunity to do so. Let's look at Matthew chapter 8, 28 through 29. You know, we have the freedom to make choices today, but we never have the opportunity of making choices without consequences when it comes to God especially. Notice the conversation between the demons and Jesus. It says, when he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesis, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now notice there's several important things here that you need to take note of. Now, I understand, and you should too, that you know, he's talking to demon-possessed people. These are demons that are talking. But notice what they acknowledge about him. They acknowledge that he's the Son of God. They know who he is. And also notice that you know, they had an opportunity, but that time has gone by. There is a time, and they know it, there is a time there of torment that's going to be brought upon them. And they know that Jesus is a part of it. Who obeys the king? Those who choose to do so. And those who choose not to, they have punishment to look forward. They don't look forward. They're going to dread it when it happens. It doesn't change the reality of it. You see, when we talk about you know, king and reigning in a kingdom, you know, sometimes in our country, you know, our country is, I mean, depending on how you want to describe it, some people call it a democracy. Uh, that's you know, a pretty broad term. If you narrow, the, narrow it down, be more specific, it's a constitutional republic. It's a representative democracy. Th those terms all you know, mean roughly the same thing to one degree or another. But 
you know, we think that um, we have the right to do whatever we want to do. We think that as U.S. citizens, you know, we can, you know, we can make, you know, we have the freedom of speech, we have the right to bear arms, all these different rights that we have and the Bill of Rights and different things. And, and we, you know, we live in a constitutional republic. We don't, you know, we don't bow the knee to some earthly king or queen. We don't. We don't live in a monarchy. But we need to keep in mind that, in a sense, we're a part of a monarchy. There is a king. Christ is the king. We are his subjects. He has told us what we need to do. He expects us to do that. And if we don't do it, then we recognize that there's going to be punishment for it. Now, we understand those concepts when it comes to looking at, like, Great Britain or different monarchies. and things. We recognize that. It always fascinates me when people in our country get so enamored with the monarchy, and I'm like, do you understand? You know, you have great rights and great freedoms in this country. Don't you think you should stand up for them, speak out for them? God has greatly blessed this country, and one of the blessings that we better utilize is the ability to go out and preach and teach the gospel. But you need to understand, you know, we have great freedoms in this country that if we approach that with religion, and we think that, you know, Jesus, you know, he's not going to care. His word, well, you know, maybe we'll follow it, maybe we won't. Um, you know, maybe we'll become a Christian, maybe we won't. I mean, it, it, he's really not going to care. But ask yourself, it, you know, that's sort of a you know, slippery slope kind of argument. It's not even an argument. That's just saying, I don't care. That's apathetic. Is that going to work? Is that going to work? We are held accountable to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And if, you know, right now we have the choice. But we have choice with consequence. We could have positive consequences or negative consequences. What are we going to choose? When we talk about who obeys the king, that includes his subjects. And we are all subject to the king. Well, as we look in a review here, the idea of Basilia defined. It means a king or a kingdom. In this, in this instance, we're talking about the term that means a kingdom. The church is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Well, who's the king? Jesus is. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the king of kings, Lord of lords. There has never been a king like him. There will never be another king like him because he is deity. He is not someone to be ignored. And too many people, are, I think, are too casual about that. Well, where is the kingdom? Well, heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And you see that expression in the Bible, and a footstool was something that was put you know, with a throne. And it was, a part, it was considered part of it. And that's the way that it is. The, heaven is his throne, and the earth is his footstool. He's reigning. What does a king do? He reigns. He reigns by decrees, and he reigns by actions. Well, where are those decrees at? Well, they're in the New Testament. I mean, it's, we call it a New Testament. A testament is a will. It's a law. It's binding. Well, whose is it? It's Christ. He shed his blood to establish it. It's his word. So what does, he, what does he do? He reigns. Who obeys the king? We all should. We all should do that. Now, as we close, let's look at, you know, let me read to you Colossians chapter 1, 13 through 14. And I want you to think about these words as we close up. Paul is writing to the Colossians, referring to their conversion through baptism. And notice what he says. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. That term conveyed means He took you from one location and put you into another. He takes you through baptism. He takes you from the kingdom of darkness and puts Him into Christ's kingdom. You do that through baptism. Now, it's not just baptism. It's faith and repentance and confession. But baptism is a part of it. If you haven't been immersed, you haven't been added to the church. If we can help you with that, please let us know. Thanks for watching. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. 
there are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns, on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.